Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another U.S. Challenge <laughs> live stream. Uh, this is a, a stream in collaboration with Q and Donors Choose and November Learning and, of course, PolyUp. Um, talking about the U.S. Challenge and uh, what we're going to do or try to do to mitigate uh, some summer learning loss and um, mitigate some of the learning loss that we're probably going to be facing um, as a result of COVID-19 and um, remote slash distance slash emergency learning at home. My name is Mike Washburn. I am the Director of Engagement for Participate. We're the streaming partner for this project. And I, I want to welcome our guests this week. I'll allow them to go ahead and introduce themselves. Go ahead, uh, Nika. How about that? Okay. Hi. So I'm Nika um, Tofirvash, and I'm actually a high schooler in California. Um, I'm in 10th grade, and I've recently been introduced with PolyUp. I think it's an amazing website, and I'm excited to jump into it later today. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Sandra Velasquez. I am a innovative, learn innovative learning and technology integration coordinator at San Mateo County Office of Education. Awesome. Well, welcome, welcome to the conversation. We've we've always had great conversations on this stream, um, and uh, and I'm looking forward to another great one today, especially when we have um, last stream we had students on the stream we had young students on the stream uh this week we have nika joining us and that's really exciting too i i love that we've been able to get a uh pretty wide range of perspectives um on how everyone is managing and handling and kind of just dealing with what's going on right now and then also center us around you know um solutions and ideas on how we can move forward and how the U.S. challenge is one of the ways that we're trying to meet this kind of need. Um, one of the things that comes up, Sandra, so often in um, almost every, if you go back and watch all the other U.S. challenge live streams, for example, you will hear this come up every time. And that's talking about... Um, um, community in online learning about the idea of um, still trying to connect yourself with your classes and with your students and students in particular, in fact, with each other. I brought up the fact that one of the things that my wife and I identified really early on in this um, pandemic season uh, was that my son wasn't spending as much time with his friends. Right. And that was affecting him. Um, and we saw it pretty much right away. So we built time into or helped him build time into his schedule, for example, so that he could just play Fortnite with his buddies because he wasn't getting any of that time. But also paying attention to our students and their social, emotional um, well-being and their mental health. This is a hugely important thing. Right, Sandra? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a foundation for learning and engagement in order for students to be ready to learn that social emotional place definitely has to be in place. And and how do you think educators um, are supposed to, and, you know, in a best case scenario, we'll maybe talk about what's actually happening um, uh, in a few minutes, but in a best case scenario, what, what do you think are some like good old kind of standby ideas that that should be applied to what we're what we're trying to do here what do you what do you think um best practices could be um i think some great practices i'm not sure if they're the best right now i think that's what we're still trying to explore yeah. but i think what um what we can stand behind is how do we create shared experiences for students? I think that's kind of what you're alluding to with your um, your son yeah. um, and with Fortnite, right? How do we create these shared experiences? How do we create these um, meaningful interactions with our students as a teacher? Um, how are you getting that to know them as a person, as just a human before yeah. as, a, as a student? Um, because once you have that avenue and they feel that there's that open line of communication um, and that trust, then we can kind of get into the hard work, which is the content and the curriculum. But we really need to know who they are. Um, so, I mean, one of the ways you can, there's many ways you can do that, but um, we're really finding in the computational thinking course that computational thinking leads to um, shared experiences around achievement and failure. So I think those are really engaging ways and exciting ways for students to discover about themselves and content. Um, 
not not the least of which being like if if you're if you're collaborating and working together you're finding solutions together you are demonstrating that leadership and community skills that we're definitely looking for our students to have right absolutely you're and you're building on prior knowledge right so you're That's taking right. what do you know from either other previous real real world experiences and um, all of our students have that so building on those assets that they have and experiences that they have to help us as a community to get through this, right? So I think it's tapping into the knowledge. I mean, I learned from, as a kindergarten teacher previously, I would learn from them all the time. I mean, <laughs> from a yeah. five-year-old, like they've got experiences and they kind of tell you how it really is, right? And they'll definitely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They will definitely share their thoughts with you if you weren't sure. Um, uh, just as a reminder, if you're watching right now on, we're streaming on on the Twitch channel, we're streaming on YouTube, we're streaming on Facebook, wherever you're watching, um, feel free to comment, to chat with us, uh, to leave um, to leave a question in the chat by all means. Um, I see them uh, and we will forward them on. Uh, Nika, related to this idea of mental health, um, you know, I'm super curious about how you feel about your situation. I mean, I, I understand that every student, every teacher, every literally every home is, we've talked about this a lot of times, every home is going to be completely different. And even within a home, one student's experience could be entirely different than another student's mm -hmm. experience. Um, and, and we're seeing that all the time right now, depending on the teacher that they have. Um, but what do you think, about your experience and especially in particular in terms of whether your do you feel like your mental health needs have been addressed in during this time are are teachers speaking to you directly about that that sort of thing about the need for making connections outside of classwork and about taking time for yourself and about not pushing yourself too hard like are how are they addressing those things uh, i'm curious to know Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think personally what I I found the proper, I think, balance during this time to, um, yeah, I guess balance like my schoolwork and mental health, but I see a lot of my friends who are actually struggling with this, with finding that source of interaction between teachers and between students. And a lot of my teachers, um, while some of them may be posting like, oh, little mental health check-ins, which I think are great, um, they don't really follow up with those. And there are a lot of our, a lot of our students who, a lot of my friends who aren't really getting this interaction and they're trying to reach chat to their teachers, but I think teachers are also, um, the, they're not exactly sure how they can connect with their students as well. So there's, there's kind of this, I guess, silence where like teacher, students often won't even reach out to their teachers. And um, mm. so, yeah, but I think it definitely, there's definitely needs to be a stronger like interaction, I guess, or connection. But mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I can't help but wonder, I mean, one of the things that we've talked about on this stream as well is you know, that teachers' mental health is a is something that needs to be, I mean, teachers are people, right? And and uh, have families. I mean, uh, my wife is a kindergarten teacher uh, and, and I'm a professional learning specialist and we're busy. And, you know, and then you have to also, you know, we have two kids who are in kindergarten uh, or are in preschool and in grade uh, six. And that means that you're busy, like taking care of your family and your lives. And then you also have these 20 to 30 other kids that you have to kind of um, continue to work with. Um, it's 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 tough. And I imagine uh, and I don't know if you've even uh, if teachers even bring this up. Uh, and I'd be curious about that, too, if teachers ever reference kind of their um, what they are trying to do themselves to manage their lives in this situation. Uh, has that ever come up at all, Nika? Yeah, and I think that's actually, it's amazing to hear that. I think it gives that student, it gives the students that other perspective that like teachers are also going through this. It's not just students. Um, they're trying to do everything they can to help us. And I think my couple of, the couple of teachers I've had who have shared their experiences during this time and what they're trying to do to manage, um, I guess, yeah, just manage. It's been, it's been really helpful for us in understanding their perspective and also just generally like coping, I guess, um, with mm. things to do. So everyone, it's been really everyone's nice coping. 
Yeah. Every, everyone's just trying to figure out how to get by, right, Sandra? We're just, you know, yeah. and you have, you work with teachers and, uh, you know, they're working their butts off. And I'll tell you, you know, there are still, um, I live in Southern Ontario. School is still on. School is still on for another four weeks. Um, there are states that are um, that are done or just about done or have just had graduation. My um, in in a, in a podcast I host, my um, co-host Glenn Irvin, they just had their gla- graduation in Sauk Rapids, Minnesota, uh, yesterday. So I mean, things are wrapping up in some places, but some places are still going. And um, you know, I think that those, especially, the, I have a lot of empathy for the teachers that still have to do this for another month. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's wearing people pretty thin, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's where community really comes in. Um, as you were alluding to, is like how do teachers um, provide that opportunity to be there for students, maybe with office hours? But I think this is a really time a good time to reach out to colleagues. And we know with our teachers that we support, we say, hey, you know, get that partner teacher, so you can both be there for office hours. You can both um, build this larger community of support. Um, you know, there might also be students that can help facilitate some of those roles, right? But I think this is really leaning into your community. And I think as Nika uh, uh, spoke to is that that transparency goes a long way, right? When the teacher is real with students and yeah. they are transparent, it opens that bridge for the students to then be a little bit more transparent with them. Like, hey, I didn't do this assignment, even that open communication, because this is what I'm going through right now. And maybe yeah. that's not, you know, but just that there's this level of understanding. Um, it helps. 100%. 100%. I, I love this comment from Fenway Fan 808 teachers trying to augment traditional or previously used channels to connect with kids. Perhaps they need to look overtly at what students are using for peer to peer social emotional connections. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we talk about this as educators all the time. This is like literally, I just tweeted. If you go and look at my Twitter uh, feed, uh, you will see a tweet from me yesterday talking about home to school connections and trying to bring a student's experience that they experience in their personal lives closer to the way that they learn. And if we can bring those two worlds closer together, students will learn better. That is literally my why. It's it's literally what I've used uh, as my reason for teaching my entire career. And this is exactly it. I mean, uh, and this is, to be honest, this is why we're on Twitch, um, you know, uh, Absolutely. we're using a tool that is not just very big right now, but is absolutely the future. Uh, it, not just the future for our students, but I think, and thankfully I'm the one who gets to decide, uh, I think it's actually the future for professional learning as well. I think that more and more teachers as for example, Nika, how old are you? Nika? You're, you're 16, 17, somewhere around there. Um, you know, in, in 10, 15 years, Nika could be that it, she's the age where she's going to be in uh, potentially be an educator. And, you know, Twitch is something that is completely familiar to these people, to this age group and mm-hmm. something that they would have no problem logging into. And so why don't we use the tools that our kids know already and use to talk with each other, to try to talk with them? Um, I don't know, TikTok. Let's yeah. all get on, let's yeah. all get on TikTok. What do you think? Well, I, I think I mentioned that before. Remember, I think it was um with a colleague yesterday. I was like, you know, how do we get engaged? Well, exactly, we get on those tools. I mean, I what did I do? I got on TikTok and I'm like, okay, what is it? <laughs> what can I teach somebody in, in a minute or 30 seconds, right? And how can I get students to teach each other in that same platform or communicate exactly. with each other? What, um, what do you what do you think of a teacher on TikTok, Nika? Is that what that what do you think of that? Actually, interestingly, um, similarly, I think uh, something very similar to that is that our on Instagram, our teacher, one of our teachers um, took over, I guess, like our high school's Instagram channel for like a day. And it was so amazing to see all the responses. <laughs> like I saw so many of my friends interacting with his posts and like he was posting about like his children and about just making tater tots throughout the day and just general like daily life things. And it was so interesting to see that like interaction like students were actually responding and commenting. And um, I think that's one thing that really did it. And I think that same teacher, another example is he started a Curious Cat account actually, mm-hmm. which is like a platform where students can anonymously ask questions. And it wasn't just school related, but it was questions all over the place from like, mm-hmm. what's your favorite Disney character to Marvel? It was 
it was all over the place. And it was so amazing to see that students who previously wouldn't be interacting with these teachers are all of a sudden stepping forward to actually communicate. And like, yeah, yeah. that was interesting. So but I think, I think it definitely maybe, works. I think, yeah, yeah. I think a good yeah, takeaway yeah. from this might be that um, educators that decide to open up a little bit to ex kind of share with their students a little bit about their humanness in terms of you know what they're dealing with and struggling with as well um gives them a chance to 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 talk about empathy and um have students demonstrate empathy with each other and um with their teachers um one of the um other things so so that is a common topic on this stream another common topic on this stream that comes up every time is about the um you know, the needs of groups of students, there are absolutely students that, um, you know, have had a struggle accessing, you know, the tools and resources and devices and whatever it else. So much of our world in education is online now. Um, you know, everything and, and now, you know, with this, everything had to move online. You almost had no other choice. Um, and so we've we've resorted to um, trying to kind of figure out how to get, you know, every student a, a device. We've tried to, essentially, we've had to figure out how to make all of North America one-to-one. -one. Uh, and we had to do it in 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 the last eight weeks, basically. And, and that's pretty, pretty difficult to do. Nika, I'm curious about your experience. Um, as far as like device equity goes, as far as access to resources and tools, how has your personal experience been? How has it been for you to be able to access, you know, have you had any problems getting online using tools and devices? Have you struggled with anything? And if you have, have you been able to find the help you needed? Mm -hmm. So I actually do have access to, I guess, internet and multiple devices and computers. So you would think that I shouldn't have any problems and should be part of the group who is like able to access these like courses but what I've realized is even I've had so many computer crashes I've had so many like moments where my internet just completely goes out at the beginning of a class or in the middle of a class and it's been really frustrating there's that stress of oh is my teacher going to like mark me absent or like what can I do about this now if I don't get my um, assignment turned in on time but I think my teachers have been super understanding and that if you email them they'll understand like your situation and be like oh it's okay just submit it when you can so yeah. I have had issues, but I guess the support is there in terms of understanding. And and Sandra, educators have been bending over backwards trying to make all this happen. Uh, I have a, a lot of friends. Uh, most most of my like tight inner circle are tech coordinators, um, heads of technology, um, you know, instructional coaches. That's kind of the 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 the, the my tight circle of friends, and they're all like um, either either handing out iPads or taking them back. <laughs> that seems to be what everyone's been doing these days. And uh, and it's been a struggle to get all of this stuff out to everybody. Yeah, it's, it's a heavy lift. So there's, a, there's several layers to it, right? So one, it's just the distribution in that way. And then it's the bandwidth of our IT team. We haven't had to have like the IT support, that's the technical support that's needed. Um, there's also this uh, phase of, um, safety, right? So just because I'm giving yeah. a device to a student and access, does that is that equity? Is that equitable access? Are are we perpetuating some systemic issues that already exist, or are we really helping them? So I think that those are really that the ethics that I try to think through with our team is that okay, just because we're giving this device, what do we need yeah. also need to have in place to ensure that they they are safe in this new space because they may not have that experience or their families may not have the experience or knowledge on how to keep them safe in these spaces. And Nika, I'm, I'm curious how many different ways you've like learned uh, to make it really a simple way of saying it, but like, um, have you had online sessions one-to-one? -one? Have you had one-to-one -one sessions with your teachers? Have you had group sessions with your teachers? Have you, had a um had to listen to like a lecture like a almost like a one way kind of session with your with a teacher um what are the different ways that you've for lack of better words uh learned or received instruction during this time i'm i'm curious about that yeah so i guess when it comes to school i've had teachers who do have zoom classes so they'll be on a zoom call with us and 
they'll present their slides through screen sharing and like give a lecture while all 30 students listen. And then I've had other teachers who do this with the addition of discussion as in having students in breakout rooms and having them discuss to each other, which I personally find much more, um, I guess, great, good for learning as I understand much better in like a group setting. Mm -hmm. And then I've also had teachers who don't have Zoom classes. Instead, they'll have optional ones, but mainly they'll just post all the assignments online and everyone, as long as you can complete your assignments, you get credit. And then I've also had teachers who um, they'll do like a combination of all and like post assignments and like if you have, yeah, I know, a combination of all. So post assignments and they'll post lectures before class. So you're responsible for watching the lecture and then coming in class and like solving problems, I guess. And and I guess one of the one of the cool things about, for example, the U.S. challenge um, specifically is is that I feel like um, we've done a, a a good job at addressing kind of all of the different aspects of of how this would work, you know. So we have aspects uh, related to parents and and how parents are going to be involved because let's face it, parents are involved in this. Uh, they have to be, especially for students between grades, you know, kindergarten and three or four, where they would really like well kindergarten to grade one and two who can barely read at all. And then, you know, up to like grade four and five where there might, there might be readers who struggle. Um, parents need to be, you know, really involved in their students' education right now, like mm -hmm. active. And so, you know, as educators, as an educator myself, uh, we will be streaming, um, you know, almost lessons for parents, you know, actively showing how parents can be engaged with their kids on poly up and doing the us challenge um i'll i'll probably have my uh kid with me uh my son isaac with me at some point maybe nika joins me again sometime um to talk uh because that would be great as well to cover kind of all the bases um the us challenge is also covering things like um how educators could be involved in this um and q is really involved in making sure that um, educators are up to speed on on what the U.S. challenge is and how it could work and how it could help them, especially now that it's expanding into the new year, uh, into the next school year as well. So this is going to be something that doesn't just happen during the summer, but carries forward. I think the U.S. challenge, Sandra, could actually be a really powerful tool for teachers um, coming into September where we don't necessarily know what the future holds, but we know that there's this thing that could possibly really help them, especially with their math needs, right? Absolutely. Um, I think right now what we're doing at San Mateo is we have this um, two-week cohort where we're just teaching foundations of tools, maybe kind of um, what uh, Fenway Fan 808 was alluding to, that teachers are having a harder time with asynchronous learning. So giving them that opportunity to really get the foundational skills. Mm -hmm. But what we would like to do, my work I think specifically, is once you get those foundational schools, skills, how do we then level up and actually make it, it really engaging for students? And how do we change that, that look of education, right? So what it, not trying to um, make the same thing that we've always done and, and, and just do it online, but really transform it into what it, what it could be and what is meaningful for students. So I think that's the next challenge once we get them all the tools and kind of comfortable with tools. It's like, how do we then really get them to engage students in a new way of teaching? Yeah, absolutely. And and speaking of engagement, this is a really good question. We 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 um we do have an outline that we kind of run to and and I love this question that Sandra wrote in here. Uh, uh to to Nika about um about engagement, about motivation. Um I I've actually um spend some time with some folks who have written some really cool work about uh, what they call the quit point. This is the point in which students decide that they just don't want to do it anymore. And that, 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 that's a real thing, right? I mean, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm curious, you know, again, you can only speak necessarily to, to kind of to you, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm curious about what um, we're curious, what makes yeah. you want to work, especially now. I mean, I mean, everyone's pretty tired. I assume students are tired as well. Um, and, and, you know, especially when you have, you know, potentially four or five or even six other teachers and they're all doing things a little bit differently. It's, it's probably tough to keep up with how, um, how varied the, the, um, 
the learning and te- I guess teaching styles are. Um, but do you feel like um, you've pointed, been able to pinpoint what motivates you? What what has kept you kind of engaged and working? And what teachers are doing to help you stay motivated um, during this time? Yeah. So actually, I think it's really interesting you mentioned the quit point, and a lot of my um, friends have been complaining that like I think that point is when we feel like our work, the work that we're doing is busy work where it's pointless and we don't necessarily see the like um, actual use in it. And this doesn't mean that it's like not, it doesn't have a use. It's just that we students cannot see it. So Mm -hmm. often we'll feel like we're just doing assignments after assignment for the point of doing them and not for, not for the purpose of actually learning. It's just busy work and we'll get frustrated. And a lot of my friends have like texted me saying, oh my God, I feel like our teachers are just assigning work just to assign work. So one way to like, I guess, one thing that would motivate us is that interaction again, that feeling that, oh, we're solving these problems with the rest of my class, with my partners, like, um, and like it often when things are challenging, but like in a fun, I guess, creative way. And by this, like an example of this would be in my like chemistry classroom, our teacher has made like worksheets of different, like, I guess, challenging assignments. And rather than just assigning these and saying, oh, turn it in by this date, she'll have us go into breakout rooms and try and solve them together. And that not only makes it so much more fun, but we are interacting with other people and we're like challenging each other. Like, oh, like, can I solve this one before my like friend? Or it's generally a motivator. And actually another example I really wanted to bring up was my lit teacher. What he did is instead of continue with the curriculum, he realized that there's no possible way to actually complete the curriculum for the school year. So he kind of just scratched all that and um, decided that instead we're going to start like a satire unit. And he like started his own, um, I guess, lectures and he started teaching us about something that he knew we'd be more interested in. So we've watched a couple like movies on satire and we've analyzed them. And it's been a lot more fun, interactive, but also at the same time educational, because I definitely realized that I'm still learning. I'm still learning and I kind of see the point in it, too. So, yeah. Would you say do, do you prefer remote learning versus in person learning? There are a lot of aspects of remote learning that I do prefer, but I feel like the connection that you can get with um, in-person learning hasn't exactly been replicated yet. And if we were to, if we were to be able to actually replicate that connection within remote learning, within in-person learning, and create that like interaction on remote learning, then I would definitely prefer remote learning. Interesting, that, because there are definitely students that are, you know, I, I think overwhelmingly most students are struggling. Um, but I mean, we have to acknowledge that some students are thriving as well. There, there are, you know, ev- just like there's every type of person, there is every type of student and some students just would do well in this sort of environment. Um, I, I find it really, really interesting to talk about. Um, I'm going to get Nika to start getting ready to share her screen because one of the, um, one of the really neat ways that we've been able to, um, to, to kind of talk about this is through, you know, sharing what, um, what students can do on PolyUp. And so last week we had, um, last week we had Isaac and, uh, and I I cannot remember uh, the, the, the little girl's name for the life of me, but it was so great having uh, uh, um, the students on uh, who, who, you know, went through some of the basic kind of machines on PolyUp and it was fun watching them learn from their mistakes and iterate. And, um, uh, Nika has, has kind of taken the PolyUp a little bit and, and, and done some really, really cool work. And we were hoping that, um, that she could demonstrate some of that for us um on on and oh is alina thank you in the chat there it is alina very adorable it was uh it was so much fun having alina and isaac on the stream with us so uh nika are you ready to share some of your work have you been able to get that that screen figured out yes yeah should i share my screen yeah absolutely hmm hmm There it is. Awesome. Um, So can you guys see this? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So, okay. So I guess a little bit of an introduction. This was the very first um, uh, 
what machine I built. So yes, there are definitely a couple of flaws and things I need to fix, but for it being the first machine I built, I was actually kind of impressed with like, oh wow, there's there's so many things you could do with this. But I guess the goal with this machine is I wanted to incorporate trigonometry. So what you want to do, okay, let's first run it. There we go. So it's almost following this, I guess, roller coaster, and it gives you the um, the proper movement for the first half of the roller coaster. But at one point, it just goes right through, and I think we'll see that soon. Um, yeah, so it goes, yeah, it goes right through. So what you, what the student wants to do is basically find that angle and find that length for it to reach the top of the roller coaster and get to the goal. And I was hoping that they'd be able to do that through trigonometric trigonometric angles. So they would have to find the length of these two sides and then use like inverse tan to find the angle and also find the hypotenuse. So this way they're incorporating math into actually getting the roller coaster to the very top. Um, and there's a story chip that explains the goal. And if we're to look, uh, if we're to look inside the turtle, the turtle chip, we can actually see how this is done. So the student has, I guess you could say functions and um, these are also coding functions. So it's also useful in teaching that. So yeah, so they have to find the proper angle and then code for the proper movement in the car to actually get it to the top. And that's, yeah, that's what the student's supposed to do. So this was the first machine I built and it was so simple to build. And um, I've learned now that there are things I could do to fix this as in like fix the connections between the roller coasters and just generally make it m run much smoother. But for it being like the very first thing I've tried doing on PolyUp, I was super impressed with the platform and just it made me want to do more. I'm curious how long it took you to make this. Do you do you think if you could estimate? Mm -hmm. um, so I played around before actually starting to make this. I played around with PolyUp a lot more as in I started like putting other blocks on top of each other. I think at one point I tried making an obstacle course. <laughs> so overall, I think I spent an hour on this, but the machine itself took much less time. Once you get, I think, oriented with it, and once you get used to the platform, you can make machines much faster. That's really cool. It's so cool looking. You could do, like, I mean, you could really ramp up the idea of a roller coaster. Yeah. Uh, to make it, to make it, uh, you know, uh, really, really neat. That would be, a, that would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for I, sure. I love I love making I, I, I find almost any excuse. I, I think I find almost any excuse I can to make a roller coaster in any sort of games based learning thing. So like, for example, we um, participate has a has a Minecraft server, believe it or not. And uh, cool. and and what we <laughs> what we've done on the Minecraft server myself and uh, uh, somebody named Steve Isaacs, we we made a, a Minecraft roller coaster uh, using Redstone. It, it's pretty fun. This is this is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Uh, show us, show us some other stuff. Do you have anything else yeah. that you've that you've made? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So the second thing I tried doing was to make like a maze trail, and the goal of this machine was nice. to get them oriented with, I guess, what you would call like the turtle itself. And um, let's first run it. But this was, I guess, inspired by the turtle within Python. And when I first started learning Python, I had lots of things where I had to code for different machines' movements and get them to like get to different places. And I was hoping that this could help with that. So basically right now what I've pre-coded for the student to see is just a straight line up to here. What they have to do is solve this maze first on their own. So it's a bit of fun too. First they can solve the maze and then they have to go inside and code for the machine to actually follow the maze and get to the point, get to the check mark. So if we look, if we take a look inside the turtle chip for this one, let's see. Here they're able to change the movement. So instead, oh, sorry, there we go. Yeah, so instead they're able to code for which, how long, how the distance they want the car to go and like when to turn left and when to turn right. And this is supposed to get them used to coding with that turtle and that movement so that they can get the car to the end of the maze. So this is the goal of this machine. I, I think it's interesting and, and I don't know what this says about you, Nika. Um, it's, it's a good thing, <laughs> but the, the, the idea that you've coded this, um, like a teacher would code it, not 
like a student would you you didn't you didn't actually code this to do it to solve it you coded it to present it as a problem for somebody else um yeah. i'm 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 I think there, these are the kind of is there any episodes? psychology related to that? <laughs> I don't know, but I, I'm, I just feel like these are the kind of challenges that Nika was talking about earlier that could make it so engaging for teachers to consider, right? So the teacher, as your, your point is, is that doesn't need to create it because Nika's created it, right? So if you present the right, this just proves that if you present the right challenge to students, that they can, like, you don't have to be that the owner or the holder or the gatekeeper of all knowledge, right? So it really opens up a lot of pathways for students to learn from each other. Yeah, and as you said, I think there's a lot of importance from peer-to-peer -peer teaching. Like, um, not only is it more engaging, but I think peer-to-peer -peer teaching in general is um, makes it takes it off, makes it easier for the teacher as well. <laughs> but so you, yeah. so you make challenges for each other instead of uh, just the teacher being the one kind of designing all of the work. Um, yeah, you know, and the and the. Cre Sorry, go ahead. Sorry about that. I was gonna say the teacher would just need to make the criteria and constraints, and then the rest is up to the students, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and well, and the idea that creating this is learning in and of itself too, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Very, very cool. Yeah, actually, after creating this, um, I wanted to. I tried doing some other machines, and I think what was really interesting is I realized, like, wait, I want to see if I can make gravity in this machine. I want to see if I can. Because um, currently it doesn't have those physics concepts, but you can create them. So I searched up on YouTube and I found like some poly up YouTube videos showing me how to like create gravity within the machine. And I think that was really interesting because um, as like a very busy student, I was shocked to see that I was interested to actually like spending my time and like figuring out how to do other cool things and create like something such as gravity. And as an educator, we noticed that you went to YouTube to find your own answers to the problems you were having. <laughs> it, it, but it's, is it so relevant? I think that kind of goes back to many points that we're making is that, you know, we need to be able to have put real life experiences in students' hands. I mean, we don't need them any longer to recall dates and take tests on when this event happened or how it happened. It's, it's not relevant to them. That's why they're not engaged. But something like this, it, it is, right? Um, they're curious. It makes them curious about the world. It makes them curious, as she's saying, about gravity and Cody, all these different complex um, things that you can't um, create as a teacher in a, in a very uh, specialized lesson, right? There's no way to do that. Yeah, this one's really neat. It hits on a bunch of the sweet spots for learning, um, you know, game, the game, the game based learning side as well as kind of um, here uh, in, in terms of you know, being a puzzle that they have to solve. You could, you could, you could easily make a level two, I, I assume, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and carry on, uh, or, you know, um, you know, I'm not sure what the remixing kind of, um, potential is. I, I believe that there's a remix function in, in poly up as well. So this is cool because, uh, you know, this could be opened by someone else and iterated on, uh, you know, on their own as well, which mm -hmm. is really, really neat. Actually, to show that, um, what you can do is if you find a um, machine that you really like by is. someone else, yeah. you could click on the settings bar and clone machine. And then this would allow you to change the machine however you like, which is, I think, um, a really great function because it allows you to like expand on. And this could be used in the classroom setting, too. You can like peer edit, I guess, your friend's machines and like expand on class classmates work. Yeah, remixing is a super powerful. Um, part of teaching and, and that peer learning and that peer review part, um, like you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, Nika. Um, is there, you, you have a couple more, I think. Yeah, I have one more machine. Nice. Yeah. So um, this one I think is my favorite because um, being really interested in the brain, I tried making this one to be kind of difficult for the brain's coordination. And what your goal is, is to basically use your different arrow keys to go forward, backward, left, and right, and then your A and B key to turn upward and downward. And your goal is to actually connect the cubes of, connect the different cubes to make Polly a house. So you're trying to make a cube. And this seems very simple, but after hours of testing it, it took me quite a long time to like get that proper coordination to actually um, make Polly follow the outline. So right now I'm clicking the A key to make him go upward. Um, 
Oh, see, and it went downward. So, because the keys aren't necessarily what you would think they are. So when you click upward, it doesn't always go upward um, in the way you would think, because the axes are, I guess, different. So it takes, it took me, it takes quite a long time to get that coordination. And mm. this was, this was kind of more for the brain and um, just to have some fun and getting that coordination to building a house. And I built some very strange architectural designs before I actually was able to make a house. So right now, as you can see, this is not going as planned. But <laughs> <laughs> that's okay, show, though. Yeah, so that's kind of the whole point. Um, just to show the crazy designs you can make with this. But that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. And, and so that makes a that makes an entire it's it's to draw a house, yeah. You're trying to connect the cubes, yes. You're trying to connect the red cubes. But in the process, we'll probably create some very questionable houses. Are you utilizing polyup in, in school at all? Are your teachers into this? Um, I don't think any of my teachers know about polyup yet. So yet. we are not in school yet. Yet. Yeah. Yet. That's what. Yeah. I think oh, that's and and the question. Uh, if, Sorry about that. Yeah. If whether that you've gotten your teachers, you should, you should give these to your math teacher. <laughs> as, a, sure. as a as a formative or a summative assessment say look what i've done give me an a actually when i was solving some of the <laughs> curriculum based um curriculum based machines i couldn't solve one of them so i sent them to my math class i sent the machine i was working on it for alex so such a long time and my parents couldn't solve it so i sent it to my friends in my math class and i think overall we just spent like a good hour trying to solve the machine so that was definitely fun that was very fun for us and yeah got us to do math so it got you to do math well i'm excited to bring this back to um our teachers to um take a look explore together and see what we might do to get students engaged in mathematics in a new way sure and one of the things that um one of the things that i think is really neat is that this scales like like so so nick is talking about trigonometry and mm -hmm. and and um and some more advanced concept, but we we literally had a a a six year old <laughs> using poly up uh, last week. Uh, so you know you got to think a, a tool that can that can go uh, scale and complexity from a from a five or six year old all the way to a sixteen or seventeen year old and further potentially is pretty you know impressive, right? Mm -hmm. My parents yeah. were even interested in solving some of these, the curriculum ones. And they were, the curriculum ones were meant for, I guess, I think fifth to seventh graders or fifth to eighth graders. And sure. me and my parents were like sitting and like trying to do these together. And it was just such a fun time. And they actually wanted, they wanted to be there. <laughs> they were interested in solving these. No, that's great. It's a, it's a challenge, right? It's, um, mm -hmm. You know, well, that's the community. That's that community learning experience or engagement that I think we were talking about at the beginning, right? So, how do you get more people involved in this distance learning space where she's able to now communicate with her parents, maybe in a way that she wasn't doing otherwise, or engaging them in what she's learning at school in a way that um, is much better than a, a, t a parent looking at a grade on a test or an email from, you know, a teacher of what what grade she's received. They actually know what you're thinking, what you're learning, what kind of problems you're trying to solve and they're engaging in trying to solve this problem with you, which I think is, is fabulous. Mm -hmm. So I want to, uh, I want to point out that the U S challenge week one is up and running right now. It started on, uh, what's today, Thursday. So it started Tuesday. Um, and so what you can do is you can go to uschallenge.org and, um, and, if you click on the on the uh, math activities uh, button on the main page, it will take you here where you can click on uh, any of these activities for each grade, all the way uh, grade one, all the way up to grade eight. Um, and you can see there's tons of activities uh, for grade eight. There's a there's a great video, and so you can go right to uschallenge.org. And you can get started right now. You don't have to wait anymore. Um, this launched this week. And you can see um, basically the plan is to stretch virtually the entire summer. 
So you'll you'll be able to um, to play and create your own machines over the summer and then continue through uh, the fall and the springtime as well. And, and so we would encourage anyone out there that's watching or watching later, uh, head to uschallenge.org uh, and, and take a look at where we're at in the calendar. And, um, and definitely uh, share this with if, if you're a student watching or um, if you're a parent watching, uh, be sure to share this with your teachers. We actually absolutely think that this would help educators um, teach better and, and, and teach um, math in, in a really exciting, interesting, engaging way. As you could see from what Nika's talked about, um, she's, she's done, uh, she's been immersed in this and even got her friends into it, uh, and her parents into it. And that's, that's exactly what we're looking for is, uh, you know, this, this comment, what if families were able to create machines as though they were a family code night activity? That is almost exactly what, I think this could be. Um, so please uh, be sure to check out uh, the U.S. Challenge website um, to learn more about how you can get involved in the U.S. Challenge, uh, you know, right away because uh, we are up and running and it's ready to go. Um, this has been awesome. This has been a lot of fun. Um, super insightful as always. Lots of really good ideas. Nika, thank you so much for showing us um your machines and all of the cool things that you've done i i, I think it's really great that we were able to get the uh, another student's perspective and um you're super articulate and so able to really share with us exactly the way um you've been feeling and and uh and it's it was it was awesome to be able to uh to get a sense of that of what's going on in your life and and with your learning um, thank you so and, much yeah it's been great um this has been super fun too yeah. And Sandra, thank you thank so much you. as well. Thank you. You know, I deeply appreciate learning from Nika and taking some of her um, feedback and insight back to the schools and teachers to um, support them in making their instruction relevant. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so once again, uh, my name is Mike Washburn and I'm the director of Participate. This has been uh, another U.S. Challenge live stream. Uh, please be sure to join us uh, again next week at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And if you're watching and care to continue watching, we'll be back on the stream again. Uh, I don't stop, friends. Uh, right again at three o'clock, we have another stream. So uh, be sure to stick around if you got nothing to do. And uh, we'll see you again in about 12 minutes. Uh, thanks everyone for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.